Everything national headlines. Rebecca Massey was arrested late last month in front of her 10 year old daughter after complaining about the city attorney during that council meeting. The mayor said she violated a city rule barring people from criticizing city officials during public comment. A free speech advocacy group is now fighting to get that rule repealed. Do not touch me. Do not put your hands on me. The city of Surprise is under fire tonight, slapped with a lawsuit alleging it's violating the First Amendment. After this woman, Rebecca Massey, was arrested at a Surprise City Council meeting two weeks ago. Surprise's actions set a terrible example for free expression in the United States. Massey got into a heated confrontation with Surprise Mayor Skip Hall after he cut her off during public comment while she was criticizing how much money the city attorney makes. You are violating my First Amendment rights. That's your opinion. It's not okay. a matter of opinion. Do you want to be escorted out, Ms. Massey? Because that's what's going to happen, and it's going to happen in the future also. Massey was then removed from the podium by a surprise police officer and cited for trespassing. Now she's suing the city, mayor and officer who arrested her. Connor Fitzpatrick is an attorney with the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression representing Massey in the case. The First Amendment prevents the government from hauling people away to jail or in handcuffs just because the government doesn't like what they have to say. The City of Surprise has a rule that states oral communications during the City Council meeting can't be used to lodge charges or complaints against any city employees. The government can place reasonable restrictions on speech, like limiting the time people can talk during public comment. But Fitzpatrick says this rule is unconstitutional and places a muzzle on residents at public meetings. A rule like that has no place in a free society. Every American should feel comfortable going to a government meeting and making their voice heard. It's what the First Amendment is all about. And I reached out to the City of Surprise and the Surprise Police Department. They both tell me they can't comment on pending litigation. Guys. Police say they have arrested a Port Novacell soldier on charges of a child. Warrant officer one. Juan Salvador Guilen Mondragon, 36, was arrested after officials conducted an investigation following allegations he had sexual contact with a minor. Army officials say he is flight student from the California National Guard assigned to B Company in the 1 to 145th Aviation Regiment at Fort Novacell. Mondragon was taken to the Coffee County Jail upon his arrest. We start with breaking news tonight at 5. A Columbus firefighter charged with now agreeing to a plea deal, the Fairfield County Prosecutor's Office confirms Christopher Schaefer has agreed to plead guilty to one count of sexual battery and one count of gross sexual imposition. Court documents say he knew or had reasonable cause to believe the victim's ability to resist or consent was substantially impaired because of a mental or physical condition or because of advanced age. A hearing will take place in the next 30 to 60 days, but has not been scheduled yet. Schaefer was charged back in July and has been on administrative leave since then. Good morning and welcome to the Bad Apple Report. It's 7.30 a.m. bright and early right here at home on the range. Thank you so much for being here today, folks. You know, I really appreciate it. We're going to start our day out in Colorado, okay? where this Colorado cop was sentenced a month and a half ago. See, this bad apple was left under the bad apple tree, and we didn't report on him, but we're going to do it now because it's pretty important to report on Holen. Holen Mackerel, this guy admitted to pulling his gun first, this cop did, saying he felt threatened, but he said the teen fired first. Now, let's find out what really happened here. I think we all remember but let's recap. The former Colorado police officer sentenced to prison and deadly shooting of teen. A judge sentenced former Greenwood Village police officer Adam Holen to two years in prison and three years probation on Thursday in the deadly shooting of a 17-year-old. Okay, the jury found Holen guilty of manslaughter in February. There's Holen. Look, he's got a fresh Betty for his day in court. That's a fresh Betty right there. So Peyton Blitstein had... Just turned 17 when he was killed in November 2021, Holen was no longer a police officer at the time of the fatal shooting, but he still had the heart of a cop, didn't he? He sure did. Doorbell video showed Holen confronting Blitzstein. Okay, Holen confronting Blitzstein. 
and his friends about speeding through a southeast Aurora neighborhood. Oh, Karen. As the argument escalated, doorbell videos showed both Holen and Blitzstein pulling out guns and firing. Hmm. After the team was hit, Holen performed CPR. What a hero. According to an arrest affidavit, Holen admitted to pulling his gun first. Well, saying he felt threatened, but he said the team fired first. According to the arrest affidavit, the gun found near Blitzstein was a ghost gun and didn't have... Oh! Casper the gun. After the sentencing hearing in court on Thursday, Blitzstein's family reacted to the sentence. It's sad that when you have the training you have and you decide to take someone's life and you don't utilize that training, you only get two years in jail. It's sad and pathetic, this decision, said Blitzstein's father, Todd Blitzstein. And I would agree, Mr. Blitzstein. So look at that. That's what that's what a cop looks like when he knows the wheels are turned. Wonder what life's going to be like behind bars. Well, he's only got two years, so he'll be out watching the Bad Apple Report in no time. Was there a cover-up or just widely unfounded accusations? Thanks for being with us at 6. I'm Kim Gable. I'm Ken Rice. Tonight, KDK lead investigator Andy Sheehan's reporting on the accusations flying after a car crash involving a local candidate for state Senate. The allegation is that Senate candidate Recito left this bar late Saturday afternoon only to crash her car about 150 yards down the road. And yet there was no police report taken, no breathalyzer administered, and her husband drove her home. The scenario provokes suspicions of a cover-up. Democratic candidate Nicole Recito crashed her car into this telephone pole at 4.30 in the afternoon Saturday, moments after leaving the Terrace Gardens bar and restaurant. Allegheny County Republican Chairman Sam DeMarco immediately issuing a statement questioning why responding officers made no police report and did not administer a breathalyzer. He's asking the Allegheny County District Attorney's Office to investigate, calling for a full accounting. Quote, while we are grateful that Mrs. Recito apparently did not suffer serious injuries nor injure anyone else in the accident, the fact pattern calls for a more thorough investigation that we have been led to believe the Clariton police conducted. Recito's car apparently rounded this bend and came down this hill but then veered off the road, mounting this hill and colliding with this telephone pole up this stairway. I talked to my chief this morning and he basically told me that they're investigating and they're going to get as much information they can and they will get back to myself and counsel. The Clareton police did not return phone calls, but while Mayor Richard Latanzi said they're conducting an internal investigation, he says the police seem to have acted according to procedure. There was a one vehicle accident and the police responded to it and, uh, you know, I, I guess she refused uh, medical treatment and uh, they went about their business and she left. Responding to our email request, Recito has declined to be interviewed. But a spokesperson for the state Senate Democrats said Recito stopped in Terrace Gardens after a long day of campaigning and had one drink waiting to pick up dinner. On the drive home, the spokesperson said Recito veered off the road to avoid a car that had crossed the center line. Quote, it's very common to have a single car accident and not have a breathalyzer or make a police report. The police came and saw no reason to do those things. Sam DeMarco is making widely unfounded accusations while Nicole is focused on her campaign and the issues facing her district. While the mayor says Clareton is conducting an internal probe, DeMarco is asking the district attorney's office to conduct an independent investigation to determine whether special favors were given and whether there was an attempt to cover up this accident. Reporting in Clareton. New tonight from Hall County, the prosecution of former Solicitor General Stephanie Woodard has ended in a plea deal, a very good one for the embattled public official. And just two months ago, a grand jury accused Woodard of using taxpayer money as a personal piggy bank. The charges lined up closely with a Fox 5 I-Team investigation from 2022, which found that Woodard repeatedly raided funds meant for victims and witnesses to spend 
spend on herself and family members, in one case, to cremate the family dog. I team reporter Johnny Edwards was in a Hall County courtroom today where the longtime prosecutor sat at the defendant's chair. Johnny, this seems like a really good deal she got. That's right. She was a defendant receiving what can only be described as a sweetheart deal. Woodard faced 24 felony counts from the grand jury, but the state attorney general's office backed off all of them. Instead, Woodard copped to just one misdemeanor charge of unprofessional conduct. Stephanie Woodard, who for 16 years oversaw prosecutions of low-level crimes like drunk driving, shoplifting, and disorderly conduct, now guilty of a misdemeanor herself. The result of a plea deal Friday after a scathing indictment in June accused her of betraying taxpayers by pilfering public funds for personal expenses. Are you guilty of the crime or crimes to which you're pleading guilty? Yes, Your Honor, I have maintained that I made mistakes in office from the beginning and the misdemeanors as appropriate under the statute. She had faced 24 felonies. The crime she admitted, unprofessional conduct. Specifically, the law's prohibitions of malpractice, misfeasance, malfeasance in office, and demanding more money than an official is entitled to. Her sentence, 12 months probation. She went draw this out. She understands uh, as a public official that people trust and put their trust in. She had a higher duty. You'd never know it, though, to check Hall County's own court docket. As part of the negotiated plea, her criminal record no longer a public record. She is eligible for records restriction and the state does not object. Her criminal case vanishing from Hall County Court's website by Friday afternoon. Woodard's indictment followed a year and a half of investigations by the Fox 5 I team, discovering thousands of dollars budgeted to help crime victims, instead spent by Woodard on herself or family members. Expensive earbuds, noise reducing headphones, antique shopping sprees, baseball caps for Governor Brian Kemp's reelection efforts, an LSAT prep course, all classified in the books as spending for victims or witnesses. She even allegedly spent public money cremating her dog. And it was paid to me for her dog. Attorney General Chris Carr calling in the GBI soon after our first story in late 2022. Then in June, Woodard indicted on 13 counts of false statements and writings and 11 counts of theft by taking, all felonies, accusing her of bilking nearly $4,200 from public coffers. But Woodard said it was really the AG's office wasting taxpayer money by bringing the case against her, calling the indictment absurd in a statement released by her former attorneys and accusing the GBI of harassing her children when agents were aware of ongoing severe health issues that they were facing. But facing possible removal from office by Governor Kemp, Woodard resigned August 9th. Revealed in court Friday that resignation also part of the plea deal, and Woodard has to pay about $2,220 in restitution. The court is going to accept the negotiated plea uh, in this case. We asked, but so far, no explanation from Attorney General Carr's office for agreeing to such a downgrading of charges. In a news release Friday, he said of his former colleague and fellow Republican, Mrs. Woodard took advantage of our state by violating the same laws that she was elected to uphold. She has now been held accountable for her actions. Woodard's former chief assistant solicitor, Stephanie Thompson, now Hall County's acting solicitor. The plea deal gets even sweeter. The prosecutor told the judge the state has no objection to a suspended sentence upon payment of restitution, so Woodard may not even have to deal with probation. She still faces another legal entanglement. She's being sued by her former administrative assistant, who claims that after she cooperated with GBI agents, her boss retaliated, eventually driving her out of her job. Woodard, in her answer, denied the allegations. She and her former attorney made no statement after Friday's hearing. A new Cook County lawsuit alleges a patient at a women's mental health facility in southwest suburban Lamont was repeatedly raped by an employee while undergoing treatment. CBS News Chicago investigator Megan Hickey is digging into this case and a disturbing trend of allegations against workers at the center. She thought she could get help there, that she would be in a safe environment She'd be with licensed therapists. It's going to take years and years of therapy for her. Attorney Pete Flowers tells me his 24-year-old client listed as Jane Doe in the lawsuit recently filed in Cook County checked into this residential treatment facility for women in May. Within days, the suit says an employee named Eric Hampton, who was in charge of transporting her around the facility, took advantage of that role and sexually assaulted her on three different occasions. During the transfers, he would take her into a particular area and be by himself with her. 
Jane said she told her roommate about the attacks, who reported it to a staff member. Flowers says they failed to promptly act on that report. Terrified, Jane checked out of Timberline a few days later, the lawsuit says. We want to expose Timberline. And the fact that it's happened even once is horrible, about more than once. A record of 911 calls for service to the facility obtained by the CBS News Chicago investigators shows dozens of calls related to criminal sexual abuse or sexual assault since 2018. On at least eight occasions since 2020, the Lamont Police Department received reports from patients saying they had been sexually assaulted or abused. And it's not just allegations. In 2019, Timberline Knowles counselor Mike Jaxa was charged with sexually abusing six different women at Timberline Knowles. He's now required to register as a sex offender. The state needs to intervene and really at this stage and figure out what's going on there. Back in 2019, Timberline Knowles said the Mike Jaxa cases were isolated. Neither Timberline Knowles or its parent company, Acadia Healthcare, have responded to our multiple requests for comment on this story. We'll keep following up. Have you heard from any, any other victims after you filed this case? Yes, we're evaluating several other victims for sexual assaults, and we most likely will be filed additional lawsuits. So far, Hampton has not been charged criminally. Flowers says sadly his client wishes she'd never come to Timberline Knowles for help in the first place. Reporting in the Loop, Megan Hickey, CBS News Chicago Investigators. The allegations against Core Civic's Trousdale Del Turner Correctional Center is something Pastor Vanita Lewis has heard before. And the complaints continue. As the former NAACP Nashville chapter president and longtime civil rights activist. Individuals was claiming family members being raped here, constant shutdown of, of the prison 24, 48 hours, sometimes weeks on end, no calls out, no calls in, poor staffing, poor food conditions. Those allegations are being investigated by the U.S. Department of Justice. But in the meantime, Lewis and other advocates like Angel Stansberry are wanting the for-profit prison to be shut down. They are destroying our communities and we have to speak up and demand that this prison be shut down. And for those loved ones who are on the receiving call from inmates at this prison, it's tough every time they pick up the phone. Change the place or shut it down. One, they're treating those men. It's like a horror house there. It's horrible. Cindy Cummings' son is incarcerated at Trousdale and says he's been assaulted by other inmates. They took the knife and hit him in the head and it caused like a three to five inch gash. And when he did, blood was everywhere. Her concerns, she says, have gone unanswered and families like hers are why these activists speak out. We're asking the governor to look at Frank Strata, who is the commissioner of prisons, and we're asking him to be removed from his position. Lewis plans to keep fighting for those who are suffering and plans to host protests outside of the facility. You may have violated the law. You may have gotten a, a bad judgment decision. But at the end of the day, you still have your civil rights. And that, as long as that's being violated, that is not what a prison should look like. In Trousdale County, Aaron Cantrell, News Channel 5. All right, that's it for your daily harvest of bad apples. And um, although I don't like bad apples, I really do enjoy bringing the bad apple report to you. And you keep me going with your comments and hitting the like button and sharing the video with your friends and telling people about the bad apple report. I think that's awesome. You people are awesome. That's right. All you people, especially you that are here in the morning right now. You're my favorite people. Okay. You guys all rule. I thank you so much. I hope you have a great day, and we'll see you tomorrow at 7.30 a.m. bright and early. Take care, folks.